Okay, we have two lists before us, 40 and 41. 41. I'm not sure when we look at them you're going to maintain that position. Um, 41 are cross files that many of them look different. We'll go through them first. Uh, I, my goal is to get through both lists, um, and I'd like to see if we can do all this in two hours. Um, We'll see how we proceed and how long it takes. You know, as we know, as we know in committee, we have the most bills in the legislature. Um, we're moving numbers of bills, and you know, I, I want to start the process uh, providing honey to the house. We're moving bills, um, not playing any games. But if we run into any challenges or problems, we can slow down. I mean, that's sort of how the perspective, I don't want to start game playing. So, we're, well, and, and again, you need to come to me if, um, I mean, if they don't like a bill and they're going to kill it, so be it. But if they're playing games with a decent bill, that's another story. Um, so we're going to keep moving house bills um, until we shouldn't. So that's our goal. And if we put more bills than anybody else on the floor, it's because we work hard. So we're going to start on 41. I don't want to start with 83. I will come back to 83. Um, as someone said, we're not closing the door on it. Oh, uh, that's how we start. That was prompted by the vice chair. <laughs> I'm going to put that on her. Okay, uh, uh, HB 156. Okay, uh, Senate Bill 156. Uh, if you recall this from Friday, offered an amendment, and I believe it's in your packet, uh, that essentially would add the Senate amendments, and it would add this language that would exempt or at least allow the University of Baltimore, University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, and the University of Maryland Global Campus to comply with the provisions um, to the extent practicable. And... And you have to excuse me, it's a little challenging. I didn't expect to be home for this. And he did send an explanation of why uh, he chose to uh, put this amendment forth. And a lot of that was because of the special circumstances of these particular campuses. If I recall correctly, uh, part of it was that these, a lot of the students that attend these campuses aren't from that particular area. And in, in particular, the Maryland University of Global Campus is mostly online, so they're complying with certain provisions of this would be more of a challenge. Um, if you have any more questions, I'm going to try and see if I can locate his email to me. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense regarding campus. I'm not sure University of Baltimore, how that fits into that. Um, but... Anyway, um, this was before us <clears throat> yesterday. We passed the Senate version. I don't know if they, did they amend the Senate version, the Elfrith bill? I don't think that has moved yet. Moved in the House? Right. Hmm. Okay, uh, what's the pleasure of the committee on this, uh, Madam Vice Chair? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Goodman, did you address why it is then that this doesn't cover or include community colleges if the same, some of the same characteristics are present? Community colleges are covered under this bill because they meet all the requirements that are in it. Um, they are um, institutions of higher education. And, you know, they live in, you know, most community college students are, you know, commuters. They live in that area. And so they would most likely be voting within that. Uh, a voting center would serve them fairly well because they mostly live in that area. And since we know that elections are residence based, that they would that these provisions would not be a challenge for a community college as opposed to, say, some of these non-residential 
on colleges. Okay, I'm a little bit confused. First off, I could go to a community college in another county because they have a program or a professor that is really appealing to me. And second, I thought the whole reason we added some of, like UMGC and some of these others, was for non-residential considerations and wanting to make sure that they were covered. So now I'm confused. Well, if you're talking about putting a, a polling place on a community college campus, it's actually better for students who live close by because they're commuting. And if they live close by, then they're more likely to be able to vote for the people on the ballot there. Um, which is interesting to me about this bill in general is a lot of institutions of higher education, the students are from out of state or they might not be from that area, so they may not be able to vote there. But the other provisions are more about uh, access to um, you know, information about how to file, you know, how to vote absentee, uh, those kind of things. I mean, that's what the bill says. And again, I don't have all my materials in front of me, so it's, this is a little bit of a challenge. As we recall, a prime part of the bill is to educate and tell students they have an opportunity to vote. Um, they can register, they can do this, they can do that. There's a coordinator to organize that. Um, so we just have to figure out whether the amendment fits the intent of the bill. I would contend that the global campus is extremely unique. Um, I don't know about the others. Uh, as you're laid on, Vice Chair. Um, we can move the bill, move the bill with the amendment. We can amend the amendment. Uh, Senator Washington. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you know, I support the intent of, of the bills, of both bills. Uh, but I, 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 I want to make sure that somehow we're doing this, the Senate and the House together. This, this, these are kind of complicated it's for us to keep going back and forth with them. So do we know if they are moving the Senate bill and they're adding or making them look alike? Do, do we have any the sense? Intent the intent yeah. is for them to look alike. Okay. This is a, I believe this is a pretty high priority for Delegate uh, Luke to move okay, this so bill. Okay. And if the Senate is amenable, he did offer amendments uh, here, adding the, the Senate amendments onto it already with right. the amendment that should be in your packet. Yeah, and, and I appreciated that. And so then the same thing will happen to the Senate bill. And then they'll. I'm sorry, I missed that. The, so the same thing will happen over in ways and means to the Senate bill, and so that they can correct each other. Okay, All right. right. But it, but if we provide an amendment, and they see it as a sensible amendment, they can just amend the Senate bill the same way. Correct. Got it. Don't all jump at once. Um, Look, we, we can hold it. Well, it's a policy question, I think. Uh, we can hold it, and somebody can uh, converse with uh, Delegate Ludke, either one of us. Okay, let's hold it till the next voting session. The vice chair will talk with uh, Delegate Ludke and maybe check in with Senator Elfrith, who's a cross file. And, you know, if this is not the right amendment, we'll get it right. And then we'll move it on Thursday or Friday. We'll still have time. Okay. Done. Okay. Uh, next, please. House Bill 295, Water Pollution, Stormwater Management Regulations, and Watershed Implementation Plans, Review and Update. This bill requires the Maryland Department of the Environment to update specific... Among other things, in updating the regulation, the department must conduct specified public outreach and consult with specified entities. Um, so this bill is nearly identical to Senate Bill 227, um, which has already passed out of this committee. Um, however, the House made a couple of additions to the entities that MDE must consult with in developing its regulations. 
Um, particularly, so if you want to pull up the third reader copy of the House bill um, on page 7, they added the Maryland Association of Soil Conservation Districts and an association with expertise in stormwater restoration project um, to that list, in addition to the Maryland Emergency Management Agency, local governments, and a private entity with design and construction experience, which were the three that the Senate had added. Which ones did they add again? So the House added the Maryland Association of Soil Conservation Districts yeah. and an association with expertise in stormwater restoration projects. Senator Washington, then Senator Carrozza. Uh, this is just a question. Is there a difference between... Okay, so, okay, so there are soil districts. Are they a part of local government? No. Thing. So they are their own thing. Okay, yeah. so that was that was my question. Um, and then an association that has expertise, we added that or did they? House. The House had that. Okay, so I guess I don't understand what in a, di it seems to me that all of these organizations have significant expertise in stormwater. So is this the, con we added some and they added two more. No, and I know. I'm just trying to decide if I agree with the two that are added. Okay. So I just want to see if it's added value. I mean, if, if it's not worth going, going over, but it just, I, I just wanted to see if it was added value to, to that. Okay, well, uh, hold that thought. Senator Carrozza? Question of added value. The Maryland Association of Soil Conservation Districts, that I think is actually a helpful addition. Uh, especially in the, the rural districts. So I, I would be very comfortable with, at, with accepting that. Uh, personally, I'm comfortable with both. Uh, I, I would move we accept the amendments of the House. Is there a second? second. Discussion. Any objection to a do, uh, uh, concurring with the House amendments? Seeing none, uh, before Question. the vote or after? Question. Uh, before. Okay. Uh, the vote in the House was really divided. It was 99 to 34, and that has no reason to guide our conversation, but I want to flag that we were unanimous. And I'm just wondering if we defer to the House, which didn't love their own version, I just want to make sure that we're doing something that, that makes sense. If you think it's better policy and they just were divided on it, that's totally fine. I just want to flag it because I noticed it. It just seems those two groups seem reasonable groups to me in terms of dealing, addressing stormwater. That's all. Soil conservation districts and uh, who, what was the other group? Association that has expertise in stormwater restoration projects. Yeah. I'd have to agree that the uh, soil conservation districts are would be a great addition. They deal with uh, WIPs or water implement, implementation plans all the time. So I, I think that's a, a, a good thing. And now, you know, we had a bill earlier this session, I, bl I believe it was sponsored by Senator McCray, to um, give Baltimore City the uh, uh, ability to have one of those uh, uh, districts, and that would make every jurisdiction in the state would have one. So they tie together nicely, I believe. Senator Washington. I'm not opposed to it. I just wanted to understand what I was voting for. I just, I literally didn't. It's an association that has expertise in stormwater. What would be an example of that? that? That's all. I mean, I think these are two good additions. I just want to make sure that I knew what they were talking you know. Well, I don't know about an association, but as you recall, when we went to the water restoration, is that correct? Do people remember that? We are in that field. So I don't know what the. I was a, we uh, uh, the, the the senator from Howard County and I were uh, in a different committee that that year. That's probably why I I missed it. <laughs> and again, it doesn't answer the question. I don't know what yeah, yeah. larger association there is. I assume somebody. Well, we can. 
The motion is to accept both to uh, concur with the, uh, how, with the House amendments. Any objection? Seeing none, we concur. Do we need to vote on the whole bill again? Yes. It's a okay. Motion. Then the, the bill is favorable as amended. No, it's just favorable. The House already amended it, so we're okay. just looking at the third reader. So okay. Uh, so the motion is favorable on 295 as they amended it. It's the full bill that came across. Anybody want to be in the negative? Okay. It's passed and sent to the floor. Next. Okay. House Bill 407, um, On-Site Sewage Disposal Systems Inspection Licensing. This bill repeals the current law requirement related to the certification of those engaged in the business of property transfer inspections for on-site sewage disposal systems, um, commonly referred to as septic systems, and instead requires that by July 1, 2022, any person, unless exempted, who engages in the business of inspecting a septic system must obtain an on-site wastewater property transfer inspection license issued by the department. Um, it is, I, this bill is identical to Senate Bill 22, which passed this committee 10 to 1. Anybody object to passing it with the same vote? No objection? Okay, then it's uh, 10 to 1 in favor. Uh, Ms. Dan, you'll find out who voted no. And That's just me. Huh? Simon Air again. Um, okay, uh, 10 to 1 in favor. Um, that'll move on as a cross file. Next. House Bill 485, we're actually still waiting on the revised fiscal note for. I thought we'd have it today, but we don't. Next. Okay, House Bill 777. Power Plant Research Program Review of Application for Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity Alterations. Um, this bill repeals the statewide goal that at least one percent, sorry, <laughs> looking at the wrong thing. Um, this bill establishes a six-month deadline for the Maryland Department of the Environment and the Department of Natural Resources to review and make recommendations on a completed application for Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity. Bill also adds additional specificity for evaluations and recommendations made by the two departments. Um, this bill is identical to the cross file, which was sent Bill 417, um, which passed this committee. 8 3. 8 3. It, it's the same bill. Anybody object to just replicating that vote? Okay, it'll be the same vote, uh, 8 to 3, as passed the House bill, which I believe was mine. Next bill. Just clarifying. Yep. So it is essentially the same bill, but the House did have an amendment on that one, as we said before. So um, are we being... It's the, the House had an amendment, but so did we. It's identical amendments. Okay, so if it's identical, identical, but if it's essentially the same, you would flag yes. what the differences are? Okay, yeah. thank you. Next. All right. House Bill 790. This bill repeals the statewide goal that at least 1% of the value of procurement contracts be made to veteran-owned small business enterprises and instead requires that the Special Secretary of the Governor's Office of Small Minority and Women Business Affairs adopt a statewide goal by regulation. Um, this bill is identical to Senate Bill 598, which passed the Senate and this committee unanimously. It was originally on this list because um, editing had suggested some technical amendments, but the House has already passed Senate Bill 598 clean, so to keep them consistent, we'll let the uh, corrective bill deal with those corrective amendments. Any, any ob uh, objection to having this reflect the Senate bill that passed unanimously? Seeing none, done. Next. Sixty. This bill, sorry, state planning preservation of agricultural land goal. This bill establishes a state goal of preserving a total of one million thirty thousand acres of productive agricultural land by 2030 through the Maryland Agricultural Land Preservation Foundation, the Maryland Green Print Program, the Rural Legacy Program, and the Maryland Environmental Trust, and the Next Generation Farmland Acquisition Program, and local land preservation programs. 
Um, this bill is nearly identical to Senate Bill 692, which passed unanimously, with the following exception. The House bill includes intent language, providing that it is the intent of the General Assembly that this act shall be construed as extending the deadline to meet the state's agricultural land preservation goal under Joint Resolutions 16 and 17 of the Acts of 2002, from 2022 to 2030, and to include acres preserved through the Maryland Environmental Trust and the Next Generation Farmland Acquisition Program as contributing toward the goal. No. So the, that intent language is new, is, was different in the House. That's, that's the only thing that's different. Uh, what is the implication of that? One, I don't want to have, force you to make a value judgment uh, one is it needed, although you don't have to answer that. What is the implication of their language added to our bill? Uh, it's it's just clarifying what the that the bill is uh, the bill's relation to the joint resolutions. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it was necessary, but it it does help connect it legislative history wise. Much I defended or I presented this bill on the floor. It's aspirational. They've moved the goalposts down another ten years or so. Uh, I, I find their um, addition fine. It makes no substantive change. So I'd like to accept the House bill. Anybody object? I'm going to assume that's moved and seconded. Uh, that we uh, recommend favor on the House bill, and they can go ahead and uh, amend ours. Seeing no objection, uh, that will pass as so, explained. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. So I, I'm still voting for it, but I, just a, a point of reference, I, I'm on that joint uh, subcommittee on open space and ag preservation. Uh, I think the, the, real, the reason they're on to the push this back is because there, there hasn't been the funding to uh, preserve more of these acres. So a lot of these, there's a lot of projects that would like to be preserved on waiting lists, and they're not able to do it because honestly a lack of funding I know we have a lot of those in Harford County so just some for the committee to keep in mind in the future uh, there's a lot more ag preservation that could happen if the funding was available but that's that's the case with a lot of projects so thank you uh, if you need the phone number to call the second floor uh, <laughs> did, did they pick up as a question House Bill 878, Bay Restoration Fund, authorize uses and county authority to incur indebtedness. This bill authorizes a county to borrow money and incur indebtedness through the issuance of and sale of notes in anticipation of the receipt of the county's allocation of funds from the Bay Restoration Fund. Um, it also specifies the authorized uses of the net proceeds of the sale of any such notes. So this bill is not identical to the cross file, which was seven, Senate Bill 701, um, which passed this committee unanimously. The House bill expands the authorized uses of the septics account within the Bay Restoration Fund, specifically um, by allowing up to 100% of the cost of repairing or replacing a failing on-site sewage disposal system with a system that uses the best available technology for nitrogen move, removal, um, and up to 100% of all costs associated with the installation of a new septic system. The House bill also does not include clarifying language added to the Senate bill to specify that the bill only applies to allocations from the septics account of the Bay Restoration Fund. Um, just in a little bit more background, so the, the Maryland Department of the Environment has f flagged some concerns with the, the expanded authorization under the House bill. Um, there is an amendment on your desk, um, so it's amendment number 354538-1 from Senator Pinsky. Um, this amendment would strike the expanded authorization for the use of funds from the septics account and instead authorize counties that choose to issue notes as provided in the bill to use the proceeds to make grants and loans to cover engineering cost and non-best available technology components needed for the repair of an existing system or the installation of a new system. Um, the bill also adds the clarifying language from the Senate bill regarding, you know, that the, the, um, the, this is only applying to the local allocations from the septics account. Uh, 
Yeah, it's, it's my understanding that some of the stakeholders, including MDE, work these amendments out. Uh, I have to tell you, um, uh, I'm not as uh, formally understanding of them, but I do know that there were two or three parties that had concerns with the House amendments, which I think I would have anyway. Uh, Senator Carroza. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for that update. I, I do know that um, the, concern, the amendments that were added in the House bill would be problematic for, I know, my, uh, at least one of my local counties. So what I don't know yet is if the, if the um, Pinsky amendments address the concern that they would have had with the House added amendments. And I can try to check quickly, but I, this whole issue about, um, you know, the, the, as I understand it, the purpose of this bill was to give, you know, this, um, to give the, you know, the county some flexibility here. <laughs> but then it looks like these House amendments went in the other direction. And what I can't figure out is if coming back to, in order to moderate the House amendments, if they're still a problem locally. That's where I'm struggling. And MDE signed off on these? Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I can't tell you about Worcester County or Wacomico County. I, I can only tell you that MDE signed off on them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am struggling with non-best available technology components as possibly one of the weirdest phrases I've ever seen in a bill. So we are putting in the law books that we don't want to get the best stuff. And it's, we're going to say, like, you're not allowed to get the best stuff. And does that mean we are looking for the worst stuff? Like, yes, yeah, so I, I would love to understand this better. And what's the, where's, what's the bandwidth? So if we can't get the very best, what's the bottom? As king of landfills and septic systems, let me fill you in. The, this amendment of adding the full cost of the septic system was discussed in the committee on our vote, and we removed it so that we will pay for the the additional cost of the best available technology, and that way we get it to the most number of fields, of, uh, you know, re uh, restorations, replacements. As the language I see here is it makes it optional for the locals to give grants or loans and loans for drain fields. There's no at best to, uh, there is no best available technology for drain fills. There's no best available technology for engineering. But if you can't cover the cost of those components, the homeowner is not going to be able to put in the best technology to operate the septic system. Uh, I, I was going to suggest that we just go back to the, our, our Senate version, but in a sense, this gives the locals enabling authorization so that people may move forward and I would hope that they use loans as opposed to grants. So it's a compromise. Um, the best technology is the one that's run with electricity that provides elect additional oxygen through the system. It enhances the removal of nutrients. But the engineering in the drain field, that's, that's septic 101. There's no nothing we can do to give it an advanced best technology. So I understand what they're trying to do. Um, we're we're going to pay for the hardware and the technology, but the parts associated with it, there's no upgrade that you can make. Question? So first off, Senator, I 1,000% defer to your expertise on this. What I know about landfills is like infinitesimal. What I object to is the language, not the concept. So if, if we have X dollars 
and we buy the very best stuff that maybe we can only do two or three locations. And if we get the second best stuff, maybe we can do five or six locations. So I get the concept, but the idea that we're mandating to possibly buy crappy stuff just seems weird. So explain it. Best available technology is a term of art. Sure. I understand. Madam Best Vice Chair, I own a hybrid, a Toyota hybrid. Best available technology except for electric. But the tires are the tires. The tires don't help the best available technology. But if I need to get tires in order to get the vehicle down the road to take advantage of the best available technology, they'll loan me some money to get the tires going. So the drain fields and the engineering, that hasn't changed in 30 years. In other words, in those categories, there's nothing that would be defined as best available technology. The septic systems themselves do. It's a term of art. It's in law. And I think by saying non-best available, it's, it's, a, it's explaining that in those categories, there is not a formally accepted best available technology. You know, the, and the, the reason why it's specifically calling out non-best available technology is because under the paragraph one, which is cross-referencing the, um, the Bay Restoration Fund statute, so we look on make grants and loans in accordance with section 9-1605.2H21 of the environment article, that's where we already authorize them to do grants and loans for best available technology. The concern that people or the, the struggle, the challenge that some places have is if you have a failing septic system where the, the issue is the drain field, that's not a best available technology issue. That's not currently covered under the authorized uses of the Bay Restoration Fund. This would authorize these counties that are, you know, issuing notes based off of their um, local allocations. It would give them the option to be a little bit more expansive in what they allow that money to be used for. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I actually had a call with the proponents of the bill um, right after the hearing, and now I'm struggling to remember what we talked about. But they had assured me that this was not necessarily taking you know, money out of the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Fund. It was using it for leverage to incur debt. And so now I'm just seeing this amendment, and I'm getting, I'm unfortunately slightly confused again. What does the effect of the separate account in the Bay Restoration Fund do? That's just clarifying. Um, so the intent of this bill was always about using the septics account, the, the local allocation from the septics account. So it's just to clarify that we're only talking about the allocation from the septics account. If they're getting a local or an allocation from the wastewater account, which is a conversation that we've had on other bills, that that, that account, that they're two different accounts that are used for different purposes. The bill was always intended just to be about the allocations from the septics account. Okay, so are they, are we now are we, is it, is this still about incurring indebtedness or is there new grants and loans going out? Leverage, it's to use your forward funding from the account to your jurisdiction to get bonds or to borrow money. Okay, thank you very much. So the question is, there was an original narrow bill um, that first came through here, I th uh, was it Young? West. Well, West Bill. The House bill has extremely widened it, again, for local leverage. This from MDE and uh, whoever is narrowing it. So, you know, I'm willing to do whatever folks want to do here. I, I think the House bill as it is is a, is a mistake and a problem. So either I think we amend it back to the Senate bill or we accept these compromise amendments. I move we accept compromise amendments. Okay. Um, further discussion? Uh, any objection to the amendments? Okay, the amendments are adopted. Uh, the bill as amended, anybody want to vote in the negative? 
Seeing none, the bill is amended unanimous. I'll take this separate bill to the floor. Okay. <laughs> to death. Woe be to the senator who asked the question. Right. They'll need a pooper scooper. Okay, next. Stacy, you're uh, muted. Sorry, apologize. So House Bill 891, Higher Education Hunger-Free Campus Grant Program established. Uh, this is mostly the same as Senate Bill 767, which was passed unanimously by this committee. And this bill, if you recall, establishes the Hunger-Free Campus Grant Program for public institutions of higher education administered by the Maryland Higher Education Commission. The commission must allocate grant funding to any public institution that pledges a matching contribution to implement the goals of the program and is designated a hunger-free campus according to the standards of the bill. Beginning in fiscal 2023, the governor must include $150,000 annually in the budget for the program. The only change from the Senate version is the House added regional higher education centers to the bill uh, who can participate in the program. Let me defer, defer to the sponsor, um, Senator Washington, yes, of the second. Senate version. Yes. So, what I mean, is the motion? Can, in other words, we can. The, the motion would be to accept this bill as they have amended it, and then over in the House, when my will accept their amendment. It's been moved and set, seconded, uh, favorable for the House bill as it came across. Uh, debate, discussion. Would anybody like to be recorded in the negative? Seeing none, this bill will move forward to the Senate floor. So next you have House Bill 905, Education, Workforce Development Sequence Scholarships Eligibility. And this bill expands program eligibility for the Workforce Development Sequence Scholarships by altering the definition to include uh, students uh, who are participate in a registered apprenticeship program. If you take a look at the third reader house version 905, if you recall, the Senate adopted or the sponsor offered the amendment to change the definition of eligible student, and it had two parts. And the first part it had is a first-year student who is not receiving federal or state financial aid and is enrolled directly in a registered apprenticeship program that partners with a public community college. The Senate adopted the second half of that definition, but not the first. So the question committee is line seven and eight. Do you think that's an appropriate addition or not? Um, uh, I'm in the reprint. Uh, line seven to eight. They have added, we did not. Correct, Stacy. Correct. It would be to, if you want to conform it to the Senate version, you would, uh, re you would strike line seven and eight. So uh, yeah. this would allow the community college, the, I just want to make the workforce development sequence. This is the, a program offered by a community college. Is that, am I looking at the right place? Uh, this, yes, it is offered by, right, that is the definition starting in line 12, so a program offered by a community college that approved by the commission and composed of courses that are related to job preparation or an apprenticeship, licensure or certification, or job skill enhancements. So essentially, they can't be in this program if they're receiving state or federal aid, correct? Correct. And the Senate, and the last time this came through, this committee determined that that was not appropriate, and they took that language out of the sponsor's amendment. Let, let me ask a quick question, then I'll go to the vice chair. How, how does this fit with the Promise Scholarship? Which is a, a, which is a last dollar after other state aid. Can, 
Can the promise be used for the um, workforce development sequence? Did we amend the bill to allow that? The law? Let's see. Um, I'm trying to think is that it allows for, I don't, does it allow for just a job sequence where I think it has to be a credit or a non credit bearing? Maybe. Now, yeah, I think I thought we amended that. Uh, hold on that for a moment, Stacy. Uh, sure. Senator Kagan. I'm going to suggest that we not recede to the to the House. I thought our version was better, and we wanted it to be more inclusive. I actually dislike the restrictions that the House put back. So I'd like to move that we amend this House bill to look like the Senate bill sponsored by Senator Benson that we sent over to them. Any objections? Uh, seeing none, uh, the bill as amended is on... Uh, before us, anybody object to that action? Okay, uh, it's unanimous uh, with our amendment, uh, putting it to the floor. Next. Okay. This uh, next bill is House Bill 1060, Charles County Board of Education Membership Alterations. This is similar to Senate Bill 749, as passed unanimous by this committee. And this makes changes to the Charles County Board of Education um, by, by requiring the members to be elected from county commissioner districts instead of, um, yes, all right, let me start again here. Got a little confused. So right now the Charles County Board of Education has seven elected members and they're um, elected at large. The bill would change that to being elected from county commissioner districts and it would require the house bill does not alter the number of, of members it leaves it at seven the senate amendments altered the number of members from seven to nine and added one member to be elected at large and two of these members to be elected from each of the county commissioner districts. Those are the differences between the two bills. Okay. Senator Ellis was able to power through that, the Senate version and uh, the power broker in Charles County. What's your pleasure here, Senator? <laughs> okay. uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so, uh, Senate, uh, Delegate Parrison, the uh, House sponsor, agreed to accept the Senate's uh, version of the bill. And so had some amendments drawn up. I'm not, I didn't see the package. But so then the motion it. is to um, conform it to the Senate ver amend it and conform it to the mm -hmm. Senate version. Right. Okay. Uh, so the amendments are adopted. The bill as amended, anybody object to the legislation? Yes. Um, I know there's another bill we haven't had yet dealing with commissioners, and I know that bo deals with boards of elections, and I think that goes in a different direction than the Senate bill. So are we going to proceed this way on this and proceed a different way on another bill? I mean, as far as policy goes. Well, we haven't taken up the well, yeah. Could I answer that, sir? Sure. Uh, those two bills... Uh, six, House Bill 6 is 5 is the commissioner bill, which calls for district-based voting also for commissioners. This bill calls for district-based voting for school board members. So different bodies, but the same concept. It's a, at large, both of them are district-based voting. But I may have misheard it. I thought the House amended it to be that way, but we're taking the Senate version, which is. Yeah, the, as you know, the Senator came in with a bill that had a lot of resistance from the commissioners. Mm -hmm. They worked it out and they agreed to districts as long as it was commissioner districts. Mm -hmm. So they worked out a compromise and they support his version. The House has agreed to take his version for Charles County. There's another statewide bill, I believe, the Crosby bill, that deals with at-large elections and local elections for commissioners. We haven't taken that up yet. 
Uh, I guess at some point we will. It's, obviously, it was very controversial in the House, um, and I think each one should stand alone, and if one supersedes the other, we'll have to deal with that. Final statement? Please. I'm, I'm going to give the local courtesy and go with the good senator over there. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Uh, any objection to uh, the bill as amended? Seeing none, uh, that passes unanimously to the floor uh, to look like the original Senate bill. Next. House Bill 1136, Anne Arundel County it's Alcoholic Beverages. Licen licenses annual fees. Um, this bill requires the Anne Arundel County Board of License Commissioners to reimburse each license holder in the county the entire amount of the annual license fee for certain classes of alcoholic beverages licenses for the 2022, sorry, 2020 2021 licensing period. Um, this is not identical to Senate Bill 944, which provided for the reimbursements to, com to be completed in the following fiscal year if necessary. Um, the Senate delegation has asked us to conform the Senate bill or conform the House bill to its Senate cross file. Okay. Um, so the motion is to conform the House bill to the Senate. That means adopting the amendments to make it look that way. Any objection? The bill as amended. Any objection? Seeing none, the bill passed unanimously to the floor. Next, uh, 1207. House Bill 1207, Environment, Commission on Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities, Reform. This bill makes several changes to the Commission on Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities. The bill alters the composition of the commission and the designation of the chair, requires that to the extent practicable, the membership must reflect the racial, gender, ethnic, and geographic diversity of the state as specified. Um, requires the Maryland Department of the Environment to provide new commission members with specified orientation and requires the commission to meet at least six times per calendar year and establishes meeting requirements as specified. Um, the bill also alters and expands the required duties of the commission. The bill is not identical to Senate Bill 674. Um, the House bill includes the following differences. So if you want to look at the third reader of House Bill 1207, um, it strikes representatives that were to be jointly appointed by the Senate President and the Speaker. This is on pages three through four. And instead um, increases the number um, of appointees from the governor. So for example, in the House or in the Senate bill, there was one representative of an environmental justice committee be, or community appointed by the governor and several appointed by the um, jointly by the Speaker and the Senate President. This puts all of those, it doesn't inc alter the number, it just makes them all governors and appointees. Um, it also adds two representatives of a labor union designated by the Maryland State and DC AFL-CIO. Um, the House bill also requires the commission to establish a rotating meeting location or rotating meeting locations in different geographic locations of the state and specifies that meetings must be reasonably accessible to all attendees, including persons with limited English proficiency and disabilities. That's on page five of the bill. Um, it requires the Department of the Environment to give 30 days notice of commission meetings, also on page five. It prohibits a member of the commission from representing more than one entity or group. That's page five. Um, and finally, it makes some, uh, some alters the responsibilities a little bit of the, the commission, just adds some additional language. That's on page six. That's all. That's all. <laughs> uh, Senator Washington, and then Senator Patterson. As my niece might say, you're doing a little too much right there. Um, I think that, uh, so I, I, I think I'm just going to move to conform it to the Senate version. Um, this is too much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chair. Basically, I'm just going to ditto what the line colleagues on the far left uh, just proposed, but I just want to get some clarity here. April, the two labor union members, 
Now that's going to increase the overall total. Members would increase the, the overall total, I think just by one, because the or, um, right. the House amendments also, they while they maintain the a a, local government representative um, appointed by it, MAKO, they take away the local government mess okay. representative that but would be jointly appointed. But if we conform to the Senate, that would not even be an issue now, right? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I ask uh, the maker of the motion? Um, yeah, I want to be more specific. Well, okay, well, so well yeah. how does this cha change the original bill to the detriment opposed to the strengthening? Well, I, 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 I think that we, the, the Senate sponsor and the Senate drafter originally had the legislature um, appointing these. Um, I don't, it's not clear to me that the specific um, expertise that two labor unions in and of themselves are bringing to this piece. Um, that, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, I don't know why that, I, but specifically, I don't understand that. Um, and, uh, yeah. I, I, oh, and then having it ro um, rotating around, um, I believe that the commission could do that, or I don't know that that needs to be in law. Um, I would say maybe the if this amendment around limited English proficiencies or in disabilities, um, but I, frankly, I, perhaps it's something that could be worked out in um, conference. But it's it seems like a lot of minute changes that don't, except for that piece about accessibility, I, I don't think forward the original attempt, attempt of the bill, and to me seems to be an attempt to, um, sort of unless somebody's telling me otherwise, uh, you know, uh, add things that I don't think are needed. That's... Senator Ellis. <coughs> yes, um, I'm no? just looking okay. at... Just looking at the changes, Mr. Chairman, and uh, it seemed like they just rewrote some of the things we had in there. For instance, we had uh, three representatives from communities impacted by environmental justice issues, and they just changed that uh, on page three, line one, to not f fewer than four individuals from a community disproportionately impacted by environmental and public health hazards. So a lot of this is just rewarding the things we've done and uh, the effect is the same. Um, I, I'm gonna jump in here a little bit. Yeah. Um, my reading of this is that it actually increased the number of people from affected communities. Where it was three before, it says not fewer than four. So it increases people from the affected communities. It just moves no, it, it, it no. really... It was three and now it's four. Um, so it's, it's three. It's now four appointed by the governor. Under the original bill, it was one appointed by the governor, but then if you turn the page, yeah. it was three appointed by the Senate president and the um, speaker. So that crossed out language on page four, what, lines one and two. So... The other changes, and again, correct me, uh, April, it initially had um, two members of the business community and one member of labor. I think this shifts it to two members of the business community and two from labor who um, uh, health experts on environmental justice issues. So it, it puts um, uh, comparable size and weight of uh, labor and management and I thought it strengthened some of the um, charges on page six. Um, it, it, it adds including cumulative impacts, effects, and exposure, which has been a battle we've been fighting for years, and Senator Patterson's aware of that. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure 
I mean, it does change some of what we did. I think in some ways it actually strengthens the bill, but it's up to the committee. Could I, could I hold the bill and have an opportunity to, to look at it? Because, again, there's just a lot of nuts switching around that I don't get. We'll take it up Thursday or Friday. Oh, was that the last one? No, one more. You ready? Yeah. Having a hard time hearing, so. Yes, proceed. All right, House Bill 1268. This is Legal Education Success Collaborative established. This is similar to Senate Bill 526 in that um, the House passed no amendments. So the bill as drafted establishes the Legal Education Success Collaborative between the University of Baltimore School of Law, the University of Maryland School of Law, and Maryland Historically Black Colleges and Universities to increase diversity in the legal field. Beginning in fiscal 2023, the governor must appropriate 200,000 to each scholars program at UB, UM, and 50,000 to one Maryland HBCU. So as you, if you recall, the Senate uh, amended the bill per the sponsor's amendment to require, to make sure the administration of the bill was only through uh, UB law and not through, and didn't have a coordination requirement, and it lowered the fiscal note. So the governor was required to include only 125,000 uh, in each of the scholars programs to the University of Baltimore School of Law and the University of Maryland School of Law, and then required UB and UM to each put up 125,000 in matching funds. So the question is, do you want to add the Senate amendments onto the House bill, which is just passed straight? The motion is to um, conform the House bill to the Senate version. It's been moved and seconded. Um, any objection? Saying none, so moved. Um, bill as amended is moved to the floor. Okay, we're going to go back to 83, and then we'll move on to the other list. Okay. So House Bill 83, public and non-public schools, electric retractable room partitions review and report. Uh, this is not similar at all to the, to the Senate bill that we passed, Senate Bill 104. So as drafted, if you recall, uh, MSDE was required. They would put some restrictions on when uh, electric retractable room partitions could be used, including uh, when no students were in the building, uh, or when the door was locked and no students were present in the room. The House Amendment essentially strikes the bill and requires MSDE to conduct a review and evaluation and authorize the adoption of guidelines or amendments to ensure the safe operation of electric retractable room partitions and to report to the Maryland General Assembly on any actions that were taken. We, I want to stick with the Senate version that we passed. Second. Okay, I wouldn't bet the House that it's going to see any light in the, in, the, in the House, but people can do what they want. I don't like the bill. I didn't like the first version. I don't like this version, so I'm going to vote no. But you should understand, if they drastically change it, they're not going to say, they're not going to say oh, we've seen the light and, uh, and pass the, House ver the Senate version, but that's fine. Um, the motion is to accept the House ver to amend the House version to conform to the Senate version. Um, uh, anybody object to the amendments? Okay, the bill as amended. Um, who will be voting no? Uh, before we vote, I just want to say I wrote a letter when this first came up. They actually came to me two years ago or three years ago about putting legislation in after the young man, young boy died in uh, Virginia. 
I wrote to the, the state superintendent uh, saying, is there a state policy? Do you require the locals to have a policy? They scoured the locals and they said all locals had some policy. Um, and so they had basically done some report. Um, so it is what it is. Uh, on the bill as amended, anybody want to be recorded in the negative? It's one, 10 to one. Okay. Senator Patterson? No, I'm fine. Okay, I'll just... You can do whatever you want to do. I appreciate that. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, the vote will go to the floor 10 to 1. Okay. Let's um, bring the chairman to the bill. Uh, <laughs> Defend it like a tiger. You want to know what I really think? <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to go to the other list. We're going to start with um, 1048. Ms. Goodman, I think that's you. I can't hear anything that anyone is saying. <laughs> okay, we are coming to you okay. for 1048. That I could hear, thank you. Okay, and uh, Ms. Foxworth, we will get to you. Uh, if you're resting, we'll, we'll wake you up at the uh, appropriate time. Okay. I believe that you have the amendments and reprint in your packet for this voting list. Um, so House Bill 1048 is election law permanent absentee ballot list. Uh, this bill allows for a voter to request permanent absentee ballot status and be placed on a permanent absentee ballot list. A local board of elections must send an absentee ballot to each voter on the absentee ballot list each time there is an election. Uh, as you can see, there are substantial amendments to this bill. Um, so essentially what this does is it adds the amendments that we put on in the Senate to uh, Senate Bill 683, and then it makes some changes. First, uh, if you recall, and let's go to your packet on page two plus, I should say, because it, it's got no page number at the top, but it starts with A, a local board shall consider. If you recall the Senate amendment, added some requirements that a local board had to consider um, when they were determining the location of these ballot drop boxes. And we, and this committee said it would be criteria established by the State Board of Elections. These amendments would change that and it lists the various factors that a local board would have to consider. Next, uh, it requires a local board to ensure the security of ballot drop boxes and requires the state board to adopt a chain of custody procedures for the collection of election related materials in the drop boxes that is on the same page that we are looking at. That is now in section 2-305. There's no page numbers there. Um, it looks a little different. We, the, in the drafting because of, we made some changes, so it's just, some of the provisions that were already in the Senate bill have just moved a little bit to make them clearer. For example, on page three, to clarify that the state approved absentee ballot application has to include a statement explaining the process for returning a completed absentee ballot if the voter chose to receive it by fax or by internet that was moved to the provision in law regarding uh, absentee ballot applications instead of left in the permanent absentee ballot list provisions. So the next provision added here that is different from what is in the Senate bill is on page six of your reprint. And this prohibits the canvassing, electioneering, or posting of campaign material in a manner that obstructs access to the box or to place campaign or any other unauthorized material on the drop box. There's a penalty for violators. Um, it could be a misdemeanor with a fine of up to between 50 to $500 or imprisonment for not more than 60 days. Um, and then if you turn to the very last page of your reprint, 
this, uh, there's various uncodified provisions. Uh, that, that provision in Section 2 was previously in the body of the bill, but now uh, the requirement that at least 60 days before a statewide primary election that a local board send the absentee ballot application to eligible voters is now limited to the years 2022 and 2024. And there's a clarifying provision that says the local board doesn't have to send this application to individuals who are on the permanent absentee ballot list. Section three adds a um, contract requirement. So the state board of election is required to contract with a usability consultant to review all the informational materials regarding mail-in or absentee ballots. And then uh, subsection B is the requirements for the, con for the contractor. And a subsection C there is the reporting requirement regarding that uh, study. And section four is the same language from the Senate bill that talks about voter turnout requirements from the 2018, 2020, and 22 elections. The effective date is changed from October to June in order to uh, comply with that new usability study. Okay, uh, I would move um, to adopt the House bill as it came across, and if there's a second, I'll explain why. Okay, um, okay, now I've got the uh, reprint. Um, it, it's, it's close to the same, it does a few things. Uh, the, the House didn't want to go quite as far. We called for the application going out every two years ad infinitum. They said, we'll do it for two election cycles, but once you've said you're on the permanent list, you're on the permanent list, unless the other conditions kick in. So obviously we can reassess in four or six years on that. Um, the other clarifications on obstructing voting, I think, are fine and, and are clarifying. Um, and, and the other factor, and I'll, I'll put this on the table, and I know my, the minority leader might have a concern, um, uh, because next year's election is June something, and they have to mail 60 days before that, uh, and they're going to have to do certain things. Um, while I hope the governor uh, signs it, uh, there is a time constraint to ensure that it uh, is completed uh, by the end of our set, uh, end of this session. I mean, could it happen next session? Maybe, um, but so I, I, from what I've heard from the House, they've accepted much of what we did to the Kramer bill. They've uh, amended onto this bill, the uh, Wilkins bill and I think we should adopt it. So that's why I'm encouraging people to vote in favor of the House bill. It's been moved and second. Do you want to discuss it or Senator Washington? I guess you can't see my light or rare. Um, just uh, speaking on the support of the, the bill, um, we've been wanting to do some things with this issue, um, and I think it's a good combination, and, and, and it's timely, and so I support uh, a favorable. Thank you. So, I was just uh, confused on one thing. So, I was looking at on the voting list. It doesn't actually have the Senate bills across file. So originally they were just two separate bills, but they're close enough that you're kind of. That's why we're comparing them. Okay. And then one thing that uh, has been brought up to me that I don't think's addressing here. Maybe it is on the on the uh, drop boxes. Is there a requirement for them to look the same, like uniformity? Because I've heard uh, in certain areas there are you know, different colors and stuff like that. I, I think, you know, if we're going down this road, I, I think they should all look exactly the same. There is not a requirement in this bill that they be uniform in, in appearance. Is that something? Can let, we let me ask this. Who orders them? The state or the locals? Jared has the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> the state uh, chair, if you don't mind, uh, the state board orders them. Uh, and the, the, the definition has officially designated by the state board or the local board. So uh, it allows if the local boards uh, have one that is slightly different that they can designate it. But we, we ordered all the ones that were 
for the, the last election. And then as we were doing it, some had like a blue panel and other ones had white panels on the side just because of the vendor and everything else, but they were all designated by us as officials. So we, we try to, the construction of them is pretty much the same and as uniform as possible, but it, it allows us a little, if slight variations, uh, but they would all be designated by the state board. Thank you. Uh, Senator Gallian, I understand the concept so that a a postcard would have a photo, and no matter where you are in the state, it would look like that. I can just say, building on what Mr. Demarin has just indicated, uh, the Rockville location, that was the drop-off box there, that was purchased by the city of Rockville, became the number one highest used drop-off box location and was a different look, totally, because it was ordered by and paid for the city and not by the uh, local board of elections or the state board of elections. Why election or that? I guess federal. We're talking last time. I, I just think it's I, the paint schemes. Everything should be uniform. That's just my my personal thought on it. I mean, I you have some. Well, in some counties you'll have blue boxes, and some other ones you'll have red ones. And let's let's have them all be the same. That's that's just my two cents. Is that a motion or just an opinion? I I don't know how to handle it, Senator. Say that all the the uh, drop boxes are the same as far you know color scheme or I, I'm not sure what the best wording is. I think you know my intent. There shouldn't be some, all different colors. They should all be uniform. We can't hear anything that's happening. Sorry. Um, the amendment is to say they all have to be the same. I think we just heard from Mr. Demarinus that, and, and the vice chair, they are virtually the same. There are a few that have been different when purchased by the local. Um, I'm just not sure this is necessary, and it might slow down Senator the process. Whiskey, can I yes. also point out that would mean if we have differences in boxes now, that means they would have to spend money to change those boxes because they would not be uniform under this law. Okay. in favor of the Gallion Amendment, signify by raising your hand. Uh, those opposed? I, I think I saw it four to four, four to five, uh, the amendment fails. Um, yes, sir. Uh, I'd, like I'd like to make an announcement to the committee. COVID's almost over. The good representative from the State Board of, Educa Board, State Board of Elections has a great haircut. <laughs> Thank you. I've been hiding it in the sun here. So. Yeah. Uh, while he might not look like Albert Einstein, he's still a very <laughs> bright light um, and, and uh, almost genius. So, uh, yeah. Or also comments in ways and means earlier today. Uh, I happened to be there yes. when uh, he appeared, and there was shock and awe throughout the committee. Um, the um, on the bill, uh, the motion is favorable on the House bill. It's been moved and seconded. Um, roll call. Debate. Oh, I'm sorry, debate. Uh, Senator. Another amendment, if I could. Sure. So on page 23, there's a little 23 at the bottom. Um, on that page in A, it talks about the local board shall consider the following factors when determining the location of the drop box. And they have five criteria. I wanted to offer another amendment that uh, they take into consideration the geographic uh, location for the rural communities when they're determining that. Well, there is number four already says equitable distribution of ballot drop boxes throughout the county. I'm, that's a rather broad. I mean, you probably could. Hold for a minute. Um, let's find the right place. We're on page 23 of the packet. Well, there's a 23 down at the bottom of the page. I'm sorry, 23 at the bottom. Yeah. Um, 
So it's a, it's above section two three oh five. Oh, it's section two three oh four, and then it's a it's a continuation of page two where it says a at the top a local board shall, and he's looking at item number four. Right. So, I mean, if you want to say four covers everything, I mean that could cover number one as far as its equitable distribution. I think the other ones are clarifying what that means. Um, and I just want to make sure the rural people are also considered in where they put the drop boxes based on uh, geographic location. I don't think it hurts the intent of the bill. So I just have a question, Senator. Where do you see them prohibited or left out? I, I, I'm trying to understand. I'm, I'm reading one through four. And in a rural area, there's still population. Um, and I guess I'm trying to figure out if, if it's primarily a rural county, and this says the driving force should be equitable distribution throughout that county. Well, how does not, not ensure it, that the, uh, all of the rural population has opportunity for a drop box? And again, we saw in the last I, I, election that where they placed them, they put them more in some places in a, in a more populated area, very close together, only like five miles apart. And the people in the rural areas had to travel 20, 30 minutes to get to it, and they put the centers very close together to one another, which, in my mind, disenfranchises the rural people because it's not as accessible to them. So this isn't saying they have to put it there, but they have to take it into consideration as far as what I'm trying to get at is how far they have to drive. It, you know, do some people only have to go five minutes where other people have to drive a half hour? Let me ask another question. We just passed a bill today increasing the drop boxes. Um, increasing the drop boxes? I'm, I'm sorry. That's increasing the early voting centers. Right. Um, and they're usually fewer in more rural area. Maybe it's not the same analogy, but the smaller the population, the fewer drop boxes, early voting centers that they're usually likely to have. Right. I understand that the, the, when you have a minority of people, you don't get as much, but I want to make sure that they at least have some, and I want them to have that into consideration when they're drawing up. And they may say you only have 10 people out there, so we're not going to put one. But they may have a thousand people out there, and we—I think they should say, based, you know, it's going to take you 20 minutes to get to a drop box. We should put one out there. So, in other words, if there's a Eastern Shore, Worcester County or Somerset County, which is a pretty rural area, the local board, um, if they ignore it, my understanding is the state can come in and add a drop box. Well, all this is saying is the criteria when they start determining where the locations are. I'd just like them to consider that, you know, these people out here is taking a half hour to get to a drop box. Maybe we should move one out a little closer to them. Have, have we had complaints from rural areas that the local um, Board of Elections has discriminated against people in the rural area? I, I've heard complaints, yes. Be honest so did they go to the local Board of Elections, which is... I can follow up. Another senator brought this issue to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, senator Pinsky, can, yes. can I make a comment on that? Just, I want to bring your attention. Now, these are all supposed to work together. And the first one, if you notice, uh, item two says proximity of the ballot drop box to dense concentration of voters, as well as also having the equitable distribution throughout the county. So these are very similar to what the early voting center factors are supposed to be, and it was by design for that. They're, again, they're supposed to balance all of these factors out, and this, was, and this was the purpose of that, not just to have them with dense populations, but also to include geographic distribution throughout the county. That is my understanding of how the factors came to be. Um, on the Simon Air, sure. To follow up on that, it was actually the early centers that was the problem that they felt that they weren't, they were doing it in the, the dense areas and not moving it out far enough 
for those in the rural areas, which was making an undue burden on the rural people. So, again, this... Well, Senator Ellis complained about the opposite problem in his county, is that they were moving them out of the dense population centers and putting them out to where there was less population. So I think it's a local board issue more than it's an issue with the factors that are listed. This is just, you have to consider all those multiple factors before that, and then... Um, in this case, because it's in this bill, the way the Senate added it is that the state administrator can add drop boxes if she determines under this criteria, the local board did not consider the fact that it was geographically dispersed throughout the county. So, I mean, that's the protection that's offered in the Senate amendments. Well, at, at very minimal, I think it's just clarifying. I don't think it hurts the intent of the bill unless that's not the intent of the bill. Okay. Uh... Uh, we can do hands or roll call. What's your preference, Senator? Roll call. Okay, roll call on the Simon Air Amendment. Senator Kagan? No. Senator Lamb? No. Senator Ellis? No. Senator Ellis? No. Senator Ellis? No. Senator Hester? No, and just to explain my vote, I mean, I actually had people reach out to me about early voting center locations at the Howard County Fairground. So I think that is an issue, but this bill, bill is dealing with the uh, drop boxes. So I would just like to encourage the State Board of Elections to work with the locals and maybe promulgate regulations. We don't have to do it in the law at this time. So it was a no. It was a no. Sorry. Senator Ellis? No. Senator Gallion? Yes. Senator Carroza? Yes. Senator Washington? No. Senator Riley? Yes. Senator Patterson? No. Senator Simonair? Yes. And Senator Penske? No. Four seven. Okay, the amendment uh, fails on a vote of four to seven. Other amendments? Seeing none, um, the bill, uh, House Bill uh, 1048, um, roll call. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Senator. So I realize that as we are getting late in session that amendments slow down legislation and could imperil their passage and that this is important. I just want to be on the record about how many things I'm disappointed in in this bill. And um, so I will support this bill with great reluctance and look forward to working to improve the law in the future. I think permanent absentees are a terrible idea. I think the Senate bill was much better having guardrails on it. Um, any of us who have ever sent out uh, mailings to, um, to constituents who have asked for an absentee and who have been on some sort of permanent list have seen the number of returns. And we waste our time, our resources, um, and they're gone. Um, People are not going to be visiting grandma every two years for forever. They're not going to be in the hospital for the next two years for forever. Uh, and yet that's what we're doing. We're putting these people on permanent lists for forever. And the guardrails uh, to protect county funding aren't in here. Um, the, there's just a lot of stuff that's not in here that I think is really disappointing. And I regret that, that, um, that it's mandatory that we have to vote for something that needs so much work. But having said that, I vote aye, reluctantly. Continue with the vote. Yeah. Senator, Senator Lamb? Yes. Senator Hester? Yes. Senator Ellis? Yes. Senator Gallion? No. Senator Carroza? Senator Washington? Yes. Senator Riley? No. Senator Patterson? Yes. Senator Simonair? No. And Senator Penske? Yes. 7 4. Okay, uh, bill passes 7 to 4. It was sent to the um, uh, Senate floor. Okay, uh, HB 127. House Bill 127, Maryland Paint Stewardship. 
Um, this bill requires a producer of architectural paint sold at retail in the state or a representative organization acting on behalf of a producer to one, submit by January 1st, 2022, a plan for the establishment of a paint stewardship program to the Maryland Department of the Environment for approval. Two, pay a plan review fee to the department. Three, implement the program within six months after plan approval. Four, submit annual reports for the department's review. And five, pay annual report review fees to the department. The bill establishes a uniform paint stewardship assessment for architectural paint sold in the state to cover program cost and a prohibition on the sale of architectural paint unless the producer or its representative is implementing an approved paint stewardship program. Um, this bill is not cross-filed. It's one that we heard, I believe, last week. Uh, Senator Washington, I saw a hand. Being favorable. Second. 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 Discussion. Mr. 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 Much. Uh, I believe this committee passed the paint bill recently with a wholesale charge. Uh, don't we have enough paint bills already in the hopper? Uh, I'll be voting against it. Thank you. Senator, uh, I'm a little confused. Which bill did we pass? It was a wholesale. Well, wholesale tax on paint for the drop-off and recovery of paint cans. The manufacturer responsibility yeah, there, uh, for uh, environmental, yeah. They were going to establish. Producer responsibility. They were going to establish drop-off places. That's not what she said. This bill is just says report, report, and charge, and it, but you didn't list a cross file. Uh, is it exactly the same? Yeah. No. There is no cross file. We have not. We did not. This is the same one. That's that's the bill. You're I complimented the, right bill. the the delegate on it. <laughs> yeah, there was not a Senate bill cross file this year. It's come up last year and the year before and a couple of years before. We have not passed a bill on this topic this session. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. The motion is a favorable. Uh, it's been seconded. Um, those that would like to be recorded in the negative on the bill, uh, Galleon, Carroza, okay, 9 to 2. Uh, 127 will be sent to the floor. I was considering that. Uh, yeah. Okay, next, please. House Bill 391, Solid Waste Management, Prohi Prohibition on Releasing a Balloon into the Atmosphere. Uh, this bill prohibits, with specified exceptions, a person from knowingly and intentionally releasing or causing or organizing the release of a balloon into the atmosphere. Bill establishes a civil penalty of up to $250 per violation. Generally, the Maryland Department of the Environment must enforce the bill's prohibition, but the department is authorized to delegate enforcement authority to specified local authorities. Um, a person with delegated enforcement authority must report each violation to the department. This bill is identical to Senate Bill 716, which is actually up next on the list, with the following exception. The House bill includes an exception for a balloon that is attached to a radio tracking device that is released by a person who holds an amateur operator license issued by the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, the House bill has been moved favorably. Uh, is there a second? Discussion? Senator Gowdy, you want to float a... Yeah, trial balloon out? here. So, uh, is this... Two questions. First, is it? Did, I thought we passed this last year. Did it die in the House or something? It away. Okay, and then the second thing is, is this really even enforceable? Uh, yeah. To the sponsor of the Senate version. So, thank you. This, if I, if I uh, can remind my colleagues, Senator Lamb and I um, 
co-sponsored this legislation last year with Senator Hershey. Um, it passed the Senate. It also passed the House. With COVID-19, it, it did not go through for final passage. The bill has come back um, in the same posture. And again, this is, those, this is just prohibiting those who deliberately release these balloons. This bill is supported by numerous local and state environmental groups, including um, all the Maryland Coastal Bays, uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, um, uh, the Sierra Club, the Humane Society. And I also will point out, um, it's, it's if, if you, uh, maybe you don't recall the hearing, but we have our beloved Assateague ponies who have been um, injured um, with the balloons and the balloon strings and other sea and wildlife. Um, again, it's, um, it's basically to the only change in the House bill is they actually, I think, gave some other exceptions with the um, making sure that it does not apply to the release for, for um, radio tracking devices. So I'm, I'm moving, the House bill's been moved favorably. I would appreciate um, the support for this bill and then I would propose conforming my bill to the same um, for the House posture. Um, I think the amendments were good that they added. I'm trying to remember from the testimony, but it seemed to me that a lot of the, like they showed the pictures of the balloons in the fields and all that stuff, my understanding is most of those come from other states are blowing this way. Well, I can tell you from representing Assateague and Ocean City and being part of an adopt a beach cleanup, um, I have my own neighborhood on 23rd Street that they've picked up numerous, uh, you know, balloons uh, and strings and it's been damaging. Not only is it polluting the beaches, but it's also been damaging and injuring the horses and other wildlife. And then the one, one last thing is so. Uh, several years ago, a relative died very young, and they did like on his birthday did like a balloon release and their like their memory. So this would pretty much do that in right here. If well, I guess it would take like a neighbor or something like reporting this. If they saw somebody setting off a few balloons, the neighbors would have to report their neighbor. Or it, is that it's really meant to be to raise education awareness to prohibit the intentional balloon release. And obviously they're not going after small children and others that accidentally release these balloons, but it's been extremely damaging to the wildlife and sea life. And, um, and as I said, every local and state environmental group is supporting it, and it's passed the House, and I'm asking that we move the House bill and conform the Senate bill to the House bill. Okay. In the air, Minority Leader. I'm going to give us a vote for the ponies. Thank you. Any further discussion? So I support the concept of this, and I was moved by the, by the poisoning and, and choking of wildlife. I understand the concept. I'm focused on the verbiage of the bill, and I'm looking at the third reader version. So I have a few questions, and either, you know, the council or um, the sponsor of the bill could maybe help with this. First off, I'm troubled by a balloon. A balloon, one balloon just seems like a lot of, um, I, I worry about, you know, I've got an, I'm a cop and I've got an excuse now because someone let one balloon go by and whether that's racial or kids who are playing their music too loud or goofing around or something and one balloon gives me an excuse to like mess with them and charge $250, one balloon just seems excessive to me. Second, um, the language on page two, line 2728, um, this under line 13, this section does not apply to, and then under two, uh, number four, sub four, um, the negligent or unintentional release of a balloon. Those are contradictory. Unintentional is like, yeah, oops, the kid let go of the balloon by accident, but negligent is kind of what we would want to crack down on. So I'm not quite sure those adjectives seem contradictory. I also think $250 is a lot of money for a balloon. 
if I was being goofy or careless or negligent or whatever, that is a lot of money. So those are my thoughts, and I'd love to hear from the sponsor. The purpose of the bill is to prevent the intentional release of these balloons, um, you know, when you have these parties or other events. We try to, you know, have these other exceptions in the bill um, to make sure we weren't restricting. Um, and that's why if you go through it, um, you know, it does not apply to release for scientific or meteorological purposes uh, or on behalf of an agency of the state or the U.S. or in accordance with the contract with the state. Um, it's, um, or it doesn't affect um, any type of research. Um, and again, uh, I have three specific questions or four. Um, nothing you said is was responsive. Could you, are you able to respond to any okay, of those so or could counsel weigh are you, in? Are you proposing an amendment? I'm asking questions so that I can be better informed or understand what your intent or the delegate's attempt, intent might be. The, so as I said at the beginning, I, su I support the concept of what's being attempted, but we don't pass concepts. We pass words that go into law books and that are then enforced. So I want to know whether these are the right words. I have, I had Senator Lamb first. Okay, uh, Ms. Morton. So the, the negligent or unintentional, so my understanding is the bill, again, it's not, it's not meant to cover accidental or negligent. So even if you should have done better, but you let it go, it doesn't cover that. This is really just about it's, it's really more about things like actually Senator Gallion was talking about, which is like a planned balloon release, release which is completely intentional. Um, so, and then the fine provision, it's up to 250. So again, the idea there is often when we have an up to language like that, the, I, the idea is to give some discretion to the enforcement body to decide whether it's you know one person you know, with three balloons for a departed loved one, maybe they get a $25 fine versus, you know, a sporting event where they release 100 balloons. That might be your $250 fine. Okay, we're going to pause here a minute, and we're going to come right back to it, but Mr. Demarinus has to leave, and there's one more election bill. We're going to go to 738. I don't think there's a lot of controversy. We'll come right back to this. Um, Ms. Goodman, you there? Stacy, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, we're on seven thirty-eight. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Great news. House Bill seven thirty-eight, election law, certificates of candidacy and ballot questions revisions. This departmental bill establishes earlier dates prior to primary and general elections, after which successor candidates or nominees for governor or lieutenant governor may no longer be designated in the event of a candidate's or nominee's death withdrawal, declination, or disqualification, and the existing governor and lieutenant governor unit remain on the ballot. The bill also establishes earlier dates for submission of plain language summaries of constitutional amendment and referendum ballot questions to the State Board of Elections and public availability of the complete text of ballot questions. There are no amendments and there was no opposition. Is, is see a motion in favor? This Requested bill has been moved and seconded. Debate. Seeing none, uh, anybody object to passing this on to the floor? Yes. Stacey, could you just, um, I'm scrolling really fast. I'm not saying, where's the simplified ballot language? And is it the same language that this body passed unanimously last year? Jerry, go ahead and. No, it's just it's just when the the language has to be submitted to the state board from the, the uh, from the council for local board questions and for uh, statewide questions as well. So it's it's moving the date up from the fourth Monday to the first Monday. It is not your bill about the sixth grade reading level. Any uh, discussion, debate? 
anybody would like to be recorded in the negative on this bill? If not, 738 goes to the floor. Uh, now Mr. DeMarinus can go back to the barber looking for his hair. Um, he, he has exactly. another... He has another my, my uh, shaved head, so thank uh, you, and thank I, you for... Uh, thank you, uh, Jared, thank you. Okay, uh, back to the balloons. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Senator Lamb. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and happy to try to answer some of these questions, too. So, um, the, the question about one balloon and the, the fine, I guess, were the two questions, right? So... Um, the, the one balloon is, is reflective of the fact that, you know, it all it takes is one balloon, right? So to um, the center from the Eastern Shores point, you know, it was just one balloon in the pony's mouth. We've heard serious concerns about how this can even ruin infrastructure, uh, spook livestock. Um, and when it comes to ruining infrastructure, these are balloons, particularly the Mylar balloons, because they're reflective. Um, you know, are do glean and, and you know capture the eye and attention of livestock, and, and with the strings, um, can oftentimes cross power lines and lead to tens of thousands of dollars and and power outages locally. Um, the the so it is is it is it is a real problem, and even one balloon can cause that problem. As as Ms. Morton pointed out, it is up to two hundred fifty dollars per violation, but. Um, that can be scaled, you know, and, and as well, you can have a controlled balloon release where you can fill up Navy Stadium and release 10,000 balloons. That's still just a maximum of 250, right? So, and, and that's to the organizer of the event. Um, and so that's why we, we set it there. Um, and this was the same as, as where it was last year. Okay, further discussion? Senator? And then I'll go to Senator. Uh, why don't we go to Senator Ellis? Okay. He hasn't spoken on the issue. Then we'll come back to you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've been sitting here trying to be calm, and <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Vice Chair kind of set me off. Uh, <laughs> so you know, <laughs> with this, uh, we pass these laws. They're good laws, and um, with these fines and penalties, the burden always falls on our minority communities. So could I make a, uh, it's a good bill, we care about the wildlife. Could I make an amendment or that comes later? No, this is the time. You said this is? This is the time Okay. there so is one. I would like to make an amendment to uh, change the $250 violation, uh, make it $10. Uh, Hundred. Oh, so now we're just fifty. <laughs> 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 uh, look, okay. uh, whether, whether you like, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Whether you like it or not, it's got to be intentional. And if you're, if it's a group of twenty-five or two hundred people. Basically, it's a law, and they can't do that anymore because all those balloons could have harm. So I think to say if 100 balloons go up, that's a $10 fine, I don't think that's dissuasive at all. I mean, you can vote against a bill if you don't like it. I just, let's not negotiate fines because it's up to $250. Okay. I don't think they're going to jail someone if they let a balloon go. I, I just don't. Well, you know, it uh, goes to uh, you get civil fines. You can't pay it because you're poor. It goes to uh, quickly flip to a criminal event like in Ferguson. So many issues. You can't pay these civil fines, and then, you know, you get a, a court order to come pick you up. And it just it escalates. So I'm really concerned about these fines and how they're abused by certain folks in certain communities. So. Senator Ellis, I, I can appreciate that. And again, the, you know, we're really, it's up to 250 and it's really, it's not really meant as a gotcha. What this is about is just making it clear that we're going to prohibit the deliberate release of the balloons. And I do want to just remind my colleagues because in the year, last year there was an expectation that we still might be able to push it out. But when COVID-19 hit, this bill was put on hold. 
at that point, and we passed a lot of bills um, that uh, this session that were stopped, were passed um, last session. This bill did pass both the House and the Senate last session and was stopped because of COVID. In the, in the past year, I have heard from these groups, and I, again, I just want to go over them, the Sierra Club, the Assateague Coastal um, Trust, uh, the Assateague Island Alliance, the Maryland Zoo, the National Aquarium, Safe Skies Maryland, Trash Free Maryland, Maryland Votes for Animals, the Humane Society, the Maryland Farm Bureau, Animal Welfare Institute, Shore Rivers, and the Lower Shore Progressives, all of them expressing support and the expectation it would move forward this session. Okay. So could I, uh, uh, thank you, Senator, for that. Um, you know, I remember, I remind, go back to the uh, SRO bill. We had some shoot-ins, it was passed, and now we have members of black and disabled communities bearing disproportionate uh, police impact. Just so the news, five-year-old getting the handcuffs on, you know, last week. And so, you know, I'm just really nervous about these bills that put a fine on, that escalate, and certain members of our community bear, bear a disproportionate burden. And so, um, if it's going to pass, I'd like to reduce that fine. So, uh, we'll, uh, I propose, I amend my amendment to, well, that failed, but amend for $100 uh, maximum civil penalty. Second that. Okay. The discussion on the amendment, seeing none, uh, all those in favor of the amendment signify by raising your hand. Uh, three, four, five, six. It passes. Um, the amendment is $100. Uh, yes. The bill is amended. I have another. Senator? I have another amendment to this bill. Um, I would like in, to propose that in all places where it says a balloon, that it be pluralized. Balloons, so um, balloons that are released, um, balloons that are attached to, uh, balloons that, but pluralize it everywhere. So there's no possibility that one kid with one balloon uh, gets fined or detained or punished in any way by, by the law. That would be my motion. Is there a second? Okay, discussion on the amendment. Bill as amended. Um, oh, Senator? Okay. Uh, let's, let's do a roll call. This is getting over my head. Um, yeah. Um, and I do want to thank um, the Senator from the Eastern Shore for taking up this issue and, and championing this for this year. So, uh, for that reason, I appreciate your effort and we'll vote yes. In my vote, um, you know, uh, I'm just concerned about these bills that impose these fines and bring uh, law enforcement. Uh, in certain communities uh, in a disproportionate manner. And so with that, um, I vote for people over animals, so I'm voting no. Yes, yes. Ten to one on the Senate version. Uh, I assume we'll <clears throat> will amend it uh, that with a House amendment and the Senate amendment to conform it. Any objection? We'll assume that the vote will stay the same, ten to one. So so be it. Done. 
Uh, so that's uh, 391 is off the plate, and 716 is, is done. Uh, let's go to 448. Oh. Let's come back to that. Let's go to 630. House Bill 630. This is primary and secondary education, school district energy use policy and study. This bill requires each local school system to adopt or update a school district energy policy by July 1, 2022, and provides for the content of that policy. The Interagency Commission on School Construction must coordinate with the Maryland Energy Administration and the Maryland Clean Energy Center to study and make recommendations on expanding and providing additional funding for the Maryland Net Zero Energy School Initiative Grant Program. There are no amendments and there was no opposition at the hearing. Senator. It sounds like this is included in the bill that we passed for the, by the committee. Uh, can I move unfavorable? You can move however you want to move. Unfavorable. Is there a second? It, uh, seeing no second. Sorry, sorry. I meant to, I'll, I'll second it without knowing just to discuss it. What's the bill? Jared Solomon's bill. Oh. The one that Montgomery County Schools supports. That one? Yes. Uh, sorry, friend. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It sounds like much of this bill is incorporated in what we discussed for your uh, your uh, conservation bill that we passed with all the trees and the um, uh, solar panels on uh, on schools and solar ready buildings. Um, not quite sure if we need belts and suspenders. That's for, that's my observation. Uh, discussion. discussion. Please. Just for clarification, if council could just tell us with the climate solutions bill versus this, what what's the Senator Steiner, I cannot hear anything you're saying. No problem. Um, so I wanted legal counsel to tell us what the difference was between the climate solution bill that had all this in there and this. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, Senator, I think I will do it. Um, that is not the bailiwick of uh, Ms. Goodman. The the portion of the Climate Solutions Now Act that dealt with schools was for new construction. And it said that one of the first five buildings had to be uh, carbon neutral. I mean, and the other four, uh, if not carbon neutral, when they were built, had to be solar ready at, for a later point. In terms of overall energy efficiency, like um, what kind of energy they use or windows or lighting. It doesn't get into all aspects of the energy usage of, uh, of a school system. I, I, my understanding is they want an energy plan for the whole school system of how they can, how they're using energy, how they can move to clean energy, what costs, what doesn't cost, and come up with a plan. I think this is much broader than the effect that's in the Climate Solutions Now Act. So, I mean, if you think it's wrong, that's fine. Uh, two school systems, Baltimore City, Montgomery County, supported it, I think, and Arundel sent in written testimony against. All the other testimony was in favor. So, obviously, make your own choice, but I think this is broader. So, just clarifying. So this bill, does it require them, the State Department, or is this the locals to come up with a plan? Every local school system must develop uh, an energy policy for uh, monitoring, reporting, purchasing, conservation, efficiency. They have to come up with a plan. And then they have to post it on their website, update it every three years. It just, I, I haven't talked to them about this. I, I sat through the hearing as everyone else sat through the hearing. My understanding, and somebody can correct me, is he wants the local school systems to be forced to focus on it and be conscious and come up with a plan. It doesn't say it's got to include X, Y, and Z. 
They've got to put some people together and think about how they're going ahead uh, for the next three years and then post it on the website. That's my understanding. Is that fairly close, Ms. Goodman? I don't know if you heard that or not. Okay. Yes. Sure. So if certain jurisdictions want it and certain jurisdictions don't want it, can Montgomery Correct. County... Yes. Anne Arundel was in opposition. Yeah, I'm from Anne Arundel County. <laughs> so, <laughs> but my point is, do they need a law to allow them to do this? In other words, if Montgomery County wants to do this, are they prohibited by law from doing this policy study? Absolutely not. In fact, I think what they said in their testimonies, essentially they already do this. And even the bill sponsor said that some jurisdictions already do this and that, uh, but the concern was they're not updated as frequently as, as he would probably like and may not include all of the things that are listed in the bill. So my point on that is if the jurisdictions can do it already, some jurisdictions don't want to do this for whatever reason. I don't remember the note. Why are we imposing it on jurisdictions that don't want to do this? It's not their district. Or make it a local bill if it's a problem in Montgomery County. I just think imposing this on everybody is probably not the best way. And if they're already doing it, you know, how much are we really moving the needle except on jurisdictions that they're not living in um, and want to impose it on them? So. I can only say, you know, we, we just passed a bill on balloons for the whole state. Um, I, 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 th I think the belief here, and again, I didn't have a long conversation, is that all school systems, because they use so much of the county budget, and they use a lot of energy, should put some degree of focus on being... Um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, uh, intentional in terms of how they look at their energy usage and costs for that matter, in terms of lowering their cost. And I assume there's some that have done it and some that have not thought about it. It's saying everyone should be thinking about it. So if you don't think they should be, you should vote against it or vote for the uh, amendment unfavorable. Senator Riley. I don't think we have a motion on the floor. Uh, the good vice chair. Woman okay. pulled her second, so I think you're open for a positive vote. Okay. Move favorable. It's been moved as a second. And second to Senator Ellis. Discussion. Further discussion. Senator Gay. Yeah, so I'm trying to square this with another bill. On the virtual school thing, didn't the House uh, strip out the reporting on that? But now you, they want to do a report on this bill. So I, I don't. I don't understand why they would strip out a reporting requirement on one and then we're going to pass this one that on the energy use that requires it. My guess is there are probably 20 bills that we've passed so far that have some level of reporting. So I don't know why each committee does what it does, and I don't know if this committee was involved in Kerwin. I don't know who this, I don't know. Um, you know. Somebody can be principled and say we shouldn't deal with any bill that deals with X or Y, or we can take each one uh, on their own merit or demerits. So, again, it's not my bill. Uh, there's, the motion on the floor is favorable, um, and it's been seconded. Let's do a roll. Sure. If we're going to do this, I think we should do it right. Um, so they have it updated every three years. It came in as every two years. And I think we should, if we're concerned about energy, a lot can happen in three years. So I would make an amendment that it goes back to every two years, <laughs> the way it originally came in. Is there a second? Second. You know, making two-year plans, I, I, I'm going to speak against that. Making two-year plans, it, it takes a while to get everything in place and then assess your progress or lack thereof. I mean, sometimes I think it should be even longer. Um, we got to start generating longer-range thinking, not short-term thinking. So I, I would 
encourage a red vote with all due respect to my good friend um, from Anne Arundel County. Okay, on the uh, motion to go to back to two years, those in favor signify by raising your hand. Um, those opposed? Uh, uh, amendment dies. Okay, those in favor of the Simon Air Amendment, raise your hand. That's four. Those opposed to the Simon Air Amendment. <laughs> it's a sleeping giant. Okay, uh, the bill is amended. Uh, roll call. Senator Kagan? Aye. Senator Lamb? Yeah. Senator Hester? Senator Ellis? Yes. Senator Gallion? No. Senator Carosa? No. Senator Washington? Yes. Senator Riley? No. Senator Patterson? Yes. Senator Simon Air? Just explain my vote on supporting my local school board. No. Senator Penske? Yes. Six four one. Six four one. The uh, bill passed and will be sent to the floor. Next, S bill eight hundred, natural resources, waters of the state, mobile locator application. This bill requires the Department of Natural Resources to develop a mobile application for use by an individual while on the waters of the state. The purpose of the mobile application is to use interactive maps to aid an individual in determining the individual's location in real time relative to 1. aquaculture leases, 2. demonstration leases, 3. registered pound net sites, 4. natural oyster bars, 5. oyster sanctuaries, 6. public shellfish fishery areas, 7. submerged aquatic vegetation protection zones, 8. Yates bars, or 9. any other areas that the department deems relevant. It's been moved to their second. Second discussion. Seeing none, will anybody be voting in opposition to the favorable bill? Yes, sir. I don't know what this bill is about. I mean, I hear the words, but... Okay. Well, you should ask, and I'm glad you did. What is this bill about? I mean, mobile locator application? Yeah, basically um, they want the department, and I think the department is already working on something like this, but it's been a ongoing sort of request right now if you look at regulations you know about submerged aquatic vegetation protection zones or certain types of oyster bars or things like that it's just listed out as coordinates um, so you either have to find a physical map of it and then try to figure out where you are on the map or you have to figure out what those coordinates r refer to this would to be essentially make an app for your phone so that when you're out on the water, when you're boating, you can pull it up and you can look at, um, oh, I'm over an aquaculture lease right now, So, which would be helpful if, for example, you're a commercial oysterman and you need to know that, oh, this is off limits to commercial harvesting here because it's an aquaculture lease. That's, that's the general idea. Yeah, they want to move away from that center uh, where the watermen and other people, it'll be on their phone and they'll know if they're in a restricted area or not, okay. et cetera. So, Mr. Chairman, you're in favor of this? Yeah, I, I think it doesn't do any harm. I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Uh, any objection to the legislation? Seeing none, 10-0 uh, and give the vice chair an opportunity to vote on it. Next. House Bill 1040, sponsored by Delegate Kelly, Health Occupations, Pharmacist, Administration of Children's Vaccines, Study and Temporary Authority. And this let's, bill. Let's, uh, we'll come back to that. House Bill 1317. Okay. House Bill 1317, Barbers, Employment of Apprentice Barbers, Alterations. This is sponsored um, by Delegate Smith. 
it's pulling it up here. Okay, so um, the bill there, there's, this isn't a cross file um, bill um, originated in the, in the house. So the bill increases the total amount of apprentice barbers that a barbership may employ for each master barber from uh, one to three and removes a limit on the total amount of apprentice barbers that a barber shop may employ altogether. No amendments to the bill. Jared had to recuse himself on this one. Um, yeah. Uh, anybody uh, object to the favorable thing? None. That's a 10 0 as well. Let's go to um, 318. Senate Bill 318, Natural Resources, Fishing, and Hunting Rights. This bill states that the General Assembly finds that hunting and fishing are valued parts of the state's cultural and social heritage that provide unique recreational benefits to state residents, and hunting and fishing plays important parts in the state's economy and supports the conservation, preservation, and management of the state's natural resources. The bill also expresses the General Assembly's intent that residents of the state have a right to hunt and fish subject to regulation and restrictions under state laws. Is there a motion? Second, second discussion or debate. Um, uh, Sing Senator Patterson. So, is this the hunting um, uh, situation we've been dealing with all along? Uh, is it is throughout the state? Is just have a little bit. I understand the fishing component. What's what's the uh, hunting thing? <laughs> Not have to do with Sunday hunting. Um, <laughs> I, th I think that is that. That's, that's what you're getting well, we at. We just finished that from a local perspective. Yeah. Okay, no. This. Right. Okay. I mean, really, this is. Okay. This is all really right. just This sort says of that the General language. Assembly finds that hunting is a valued part of the state's culture, and it, it plays a role in the state's economy. <laughs> okay. Yes. Fine. Thank you. With enthusiasm, because um, I want to, we'll, we'll give one to Bailey, um, the only one, but one to Bailey. Um, I'm just kidding. I, I'm kidding. I was being a wise guy. That was a joke for people who are watching the streaming. Okay, uh, uh, that's a nine-one-one. Uh, one. Uh, goes to the floor. We'll see who's going to take that bill. Um, okay, that's 318. Uh, that's 318. Let's go to um, 546. Almost there, folks. Almost there. Senate Bill 546. School Buildings, Drinking Water Outlets, Elevated Level of Lead, Safe School Drinking Water Act. Um, this bill redefines the elevated level of lead to mean a lead concentration in drinking water that exceeds five parts per billion per, for purposes of required lead water testing and remedial measures in pu public and non-public schools. Um, the bill also makes a conforming changes to existing notice and remediation requirements. If a water test sample for drinking water out outlets was analyzed on or before June 1, 2021, and the analysis indicated a concentration of lead that was more than five parts per billion, but less than 20 parts per billion, which is the current um, remediation level, a school must take appropriate remedial measures by August 1st, 2022. Um, there, I passed around on, it's on your um, desk, the House Bill 636, which is the cross file. Um, which has passed, it has passed the House in this version and is currently in rules. Um, but to take a look on the last page of the bill, um, page five, the House has added um, an amendment to add language providing that the Act may not be construed to alter the priority in awarding grants under the Healthy School Facility Fund, established under Section 5 322 of the Education Article. Um, I believe that was sort of added at the um, by the chair of um, 
appropriations to, to just sort of indicate that the current priorities for funding from that program would remain. Okay, there's, it's been moved and seconded. Um, you know, we don't know what the fate is over there, obviously, um, whether it gets out of rules or not. It'll be up to Senator um, McRae, is that right? McRae. Um, okay, uh, discussion on the bill, including the House Amendment in the uncodified section. Um, seeing none, will anybody like to be recorded in the negative? Then the bill is unanimous on um, 546. Let's go back to um, 1040. All right, House Bill 1040. Um, Health Occupations, Pharmacies, Administration of Children's Vaccines, Study Temporary Authority. This is uh, cross filed with SB 736. So, uh, Senator, if I may go through SB 736 first. Um, House Bill 1040 is not identical to Senate Bill 736 at all. Um, and the context for that is the House Bill or the amendments to 736 are to conform to the House Bill. So. Um, Senate Bill 736 is an emergency bill authorizing a pharmacist to administer a vaccine to a child between the ages of 3 to 17, um, so long as the vaccine is on the CDC-approved schedule or approved by the FDA. They can do this without a prescription, um, which is a deviation from prescribed authority under current law. Authorizes a pharmacist as well to administer vaccines to an adult, so long as they, those vaccines are approved by the FDA, um, in addition to those that are approved by the CDC. Uh, the bill sets out written protocol requirements for a vaccine for adults and repeals the requirement that a written protocol for an adult, for an adult vaccine be uh, vaccine specific. Uh, pharmacist has to make an effort to follow up with the adult and child's primary care physician unless it's a flu vaccine. Um, and the pharmacist also has to uh, make sure that the record keeping requirements um, are placed in the immunet system. So as amended, SB 736 would conform to House Bill 1040, which repeals a lot of this permanent expanded authority and places a sunset on those provisions. So um, instead of giving infinite uh, expanded authority, the pharmacists would uh, be authorized to temporarily administer vaccines um, to three to 17 year olds between the time period of July 1st, 2021 to June 20th, 2023. These vaccines have to be approved by the FDA and administered through CDC's Prevention Advisory Committee schedule. The uh, bill also sets out uh, requirements in terms of education, certification, and training for pharmacists that um, attempts to administer these vaccines. They have to be CPR certified, 20 hours of training, and must document it. Uh, there's also two reporting requirements that the Health Promotion Administration within um, MDH, Maryland Department of Health, has to facilitate. So the first will be by December 1st of this year, and another is uh, by December 1st of next year, 2022. Um, and, and the study or the report has to deal with the amount of vaccines that were administered, um, the efficacy of those vaccines, um, the efficacy of the immunet system. Uh, they have to, or the report has to engage with public health models of, of other states to compare um, their systems and protocols. And the bill um, in, in the House form is also going to remove the emergency provision. So again, um, authority lasts from July 1st to June 20th, um, 2023. And um, yeah. We're going to discuss it. It's been moved. Is there a second? Okay. Could Ms. Foxworth or Dr. Lamb, Senator Lamb, just explain what type of shots we're talking about here, by and large. So when we talk about um, FDA approval, that will include our uh, coronavirus vaccine. But CDC approved is, is kind of the tetanus, diphtheria, all of those scheduled shots for children. Um, thinking some, some of those other 
annual shots, I think there's a three to five uh, measles, mumps, rubella, those things that uh, are, are required or encouraged to give at a particular timeline as children are, are growing up. And then the FDA approval expanded to some of those vaccines like um, COVID-19. So I can just elaborate. The the FDA approves of, of medications and drugs and vaccines, obviously, um, but the guidelines by which they're actually administered are done by CDC. So, uh, you know, FDA just makes sure it's safe and effective. Then CDC comes in afterwards to determine who it should be administered to, what those recommendations are, what those guidelines are, age ranges, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the same process with the COVID vaccine, for example. FDA authorized it. And then CDC came in and said, um, these are the guidance about how you can actually administer it. Is it my understanding, I'll call in the next center, is it my understanding that Department of Health has endorsed the amended version? Okay, Senator Washington. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, again, uh, this bill, again, it strikes the original bill entirely, and it really does, I think, provide an opportunity. And again, I've been talking with the bill sponsor. We are co-chair the Joint Com Committee on Children, Youth, and Families. Um, and so there's just an issue of broadly some plummeting um, um, uh, vaccine rates uh, among children. Um, and so I think it wisely provides uh, emergency authorization, but then all sunsets that, and, but also uh, looks at, uh, uh, requires a study. And the idea, honestly, is to get the department the Department of Health to work more collaboratively with stakeholders in, in addressing the, these issues. So um, again, the, the amended version, is, and it's also I checked with the Senate sponsor. Uh, he is comfortable with that as well, and so everybody's on board. Okay, so it's the House version and the Senate to uh, conform to the House version. Uh, Senator um, Ellis, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so access to vaccination is very important. I see that. I uh, go to my neighborhood pharmacy and they ask me, hey, uh, do you want a uh, single shot? I said, I don't know if I've had it in my primary care. I can't remember all my vaccinations that I've had. Um, is there any provision in this for where uh, children get in shots in this bill? Vaccinations, excuse me. Um, for the pharmacists have to check and coordinate with the child's primary care or pediatrician to make sure, you know, uh, they're not being doubly vaccinated. Uh, is there any checks and balances to make sure a registry of vaccinations that the pharmacists will have access to? Microphone to turn on, Senator. Yes. So um, there, there are mandatory provisions that would require pharmacists to make notation of the vaccine in um, a record keeping system called Immunet, um, which I think is a statewide system um, of, of data on, on these vaccines and any type of visit. Um, and the pharmacist also has to encourage the adult and the child actually to, to follow or the parent or guardian mm -hmm. um, to follow up with the PCP after it's administered. Okay, thank you. So uh, if a child gets vaccinated at their pediatrician, that's in this system, even the pediatrician have to put that vaccination in the system. And when so, the pharmacist go to administer a vaccine. So uh, the scope of Immunet as it applies to pediatricians and primary care doctors, I'm actually not sure. I, I, I don't know if Immunet is circulated only through pharmacists or if it applies to um, pediatricians. So I would have to I would have to double check on that one, Senator. I mean, yeah. that for you. the the all providers have to anyone who's administering a vaccine has to be registered, have an account with, and report to Immunet on a regular basis. And we actually passed a law, I think it was two years ago, to require all providers now to report into Immunet. So, so the follow-up question is, 
does the pharmacist or the pediatrician check it before they give the additional so it's not duplicated? I think that's where Senator Ellis was going. You know, if they were providing good practice, they should check it because there are often A, you don't want to administer a vaccine that someone may have just gotten recently. Um, two, I think it's basic clinical due diligence to check to make sure that, um, you know, for example, the COVID vaccine should not be administered within two weeks of another vaccine. And so if someone is doing due clinical diligence, they should check the records that they have to make sure that that has not taken place. Right. So is that required by law for a provider to check the registry? S so it's, it's not provided by law per se, because I think there's been a general reluctance to put clinical guidance into the law. Um, but there's, um, you know, there's, there's standards of practice that clinicians should abide by, mm -hmm. and that would be basic clinical practice to yeah. verify prior vaccination records and, and prior medical history. Right. I understand that. So if we look at the multiple possibilities for error here, can we look at the uh, pediatrician and the pharmacist? That's two. They would look at maybe dad taking a child into the pharmacist and mom taking the child in, and the different knowledge base of each and what that child might have. And, of course, the child was like, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> don't remember exactly what vaccine they got where. I'm really concerned about that. You know, um, even one child falling through the system and accidentally given a duplicate vaccine. I mean, I would love to uh, expand the access, but make sure that there is no room for error with the children as far as, you know, uh, and, you know, some pharmacists might be on a, uh, <laughs> a plan to move these vaccines, right? Um, it's part of their, I don't know if it's possible to have part of their incentive payment, uh, how many vaccines given. I'm not sure if that's allowed. But I'm really concerned about, you know, uh, children, you know, uh, being vaccinated and no record of it mandatory by law and yeah, so, their protection. So I'm happy to, to speak to this. And it's not my bill, obviously, but I'm just glancing through here. There are provisions in here to try to have those safeguards in place. It says that the, the pharmacist um, has to have completed practical training, a practical training program of at least 20 hours approved by the Council for Pharmacy Education that includes, among other things, uh, clinical evaluation of indications and contraindications of vaccines, recognition for the treatment of emergency reactions, um, et cetera, et cetera, and the pharmacist has to have completed a minimum of two hours of continuing pharmacy education, so similar to CMEs, related to immunization that's accre accredited by the um, Council for Primary or Council for Pr Pharmacy Education, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I think they try to address that in making sure that this, these are pharmacists that do have some specialized training. Um, t on how to do this and how to appropriately do this. Okay. And, and it's also a study, I think, and there's yeah. provisions in here in the uncodified language that says that the department should monitor this and then report back to the General Assembly right. as well. Yeah, I understand that part. I'm not doubting their um, pharmacist's uh, clinical skills or professionalism. I'm just saying we have to make sure that that registry is up to date and checked so that we don't have a possibility of error when it comes to administering the vaccines that we will authorize pharmacists to do because it will take the children out of their pediatrician's supervision and that vaccine card that my children have. And the vaccine, the uh, COVID, we all have a card, a COVID card. And so, you know, how can we make sure that everyone who administer a vaccine to a child actually is obligated to look at that card, whether it's online through that system or a physical card like we have with COVID. 
Yeah, I would, I would actually add that the, the Immunet is probably even more secure and verifiable than the COVID card. The COVID card is just a piece of paper. You can mm -hmm. photocopy, you can forge it, you can everything else that comes of concern with these COVID passports that we may be looking at. But Immunet has limited access to providers and pharmacists and other healthcare professionals. So the data in Immunet is, is secure in that way. So it's, it's verifiable and they can see who's accessing and who inputted the information right. into the record. And so Immunet, and Mr. Chairman, can I ask another? So the, the data on Immunet, I guess it, the system is there. Uh, is there a requirement for whoever administer immunization vaccine to a child enter that information in that system so it's accessible to everyone and pharmacists have to check it, pediatricians, new doctors have to check it? Is that a requirement? It is a requirement. We passed a law back in 2019 to require all of this information, all vaccinations to be reported into Immunet. It wasn't the case before that. Immunet okay. was a Okay. new system from, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, but yeah. they gradually increased the requirements because they recognize the value okay. of immunity. Okay. That's great. So the next step is, is Sen it used by pharmacists? S Senator, l let me just jump yeah. in for a minute. Sure. Because the House sunset it in like a year and a half, I, I think the primary purpose is probably for the COVID shots. I think it'll, it would take them six months to come up with a plan for the protocols for other vaccinations, and I have similar concerns as you do. Um, so that they put such a short sunset on this, I think it really, the expectation was, and it doesn't mean other things can't happen, they can't give other shots. I think it was very much focused on COVID and there's not a centralized system, unfortunately, you know, in the state or in the country. I, don't, I didn't get a card, I went through the county, they sent me an email. You know, and I keep it in my wallet. I should shoot a picture of it. But so it's really haphazard for now. Mm -hmm. And and as uh, Senator Lamb talked about, they're looking at that, and on a national level, they're looking at it. But there's no resolution yet. And again, that's not to dismiss your concerns, because I'm very sympathetic to them. Yeah, and I think I think the chairman's also correct that there's a short sunset because there's a heavy reporting requirement here in the, in the uncodified language about how this is working, improvements that can be done, and the department has to come back and report back to the General Assembly on all of those provisions so that they can take a closer look at it once the sunset ends. Okay. Um, the chairman uh, addressed, raised what, what I was gonna contribute to the conversation um, and also very, that also I wish we had some of these um, provisions to some of the other things we just passed, but it is, it is um, just to, to you, um, Senator, that, you know, I know you're, it, specifically the report is looking at the effectiveness and efficiency of the immunit system. Um, it's gonna obtain uh, input from healthcare providers, but also in terms of the health of the, st of the, of the young people, they're also gonna be looking and looking at data from pediatric primary care providers. We're gonna see does, there's some concern about well, people won't bring their child to their primary care if they can get their vaccines um, at the pharmacy. And so there's specifically, um, uh, we're gonna look at that and making sure that it's not, um, I'm saying we, but the, <laughs> the, the bill will look at that to make sure that it's not uh, affecting primary care, care visits. So I, I, it was, I, I think the HDO did a, a very good job in, in really trying to address the, the concerns that a lot of us have about uh, pharmacies, um, you know, expand, expanding the ability of pharmacies to um, do vaccines. And again, I wish some, it was extended to some of the other for adults. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think Senator Washington actually may have answered my question. I, my concern with this, I understand the access issue, but I worry about the unintended consequences of potentially not having some well child visits if you know, oh, it's easier, I just, you know, go to the pharmacist and get this. I, I don't want to see, you know, well, well, child visits are very important. I don't want, I'm worried about unintended consequences of, you know, a, a, a loss of those. So if that's kind of covered in there, that would maybe answer that uh, concern of mine. Okay, we have the two bills in front of us, the House bill and the Senate bill. 
uh, conforming to the House bill. Um, any further discussion? I assume it will be the same vote on each one. Uh, would anybody like to be uh, recorded in the negative on either bill or both bills? Okay, then the um, Senate bill is amended, and the House bill will go to the, both go to the floor um, accordingly. Okay, we're down to two more. I'm going to um, 448. I'm going to wait till later in the week. You know, I haven't had a chance to talk to Senator Ellis. You know, he's got a a, a bill similar, not necessarily they're in conflict. Um, I need to talk to Senator Ellis and the Senate President and the Speaker about some of these issues. So I, I'm going to wait a couple of days. It's a House bill, so it's not like we're being crushed on this one. So 448 is a hold. Uh, we are going to have one more voting session this week. And then um, Senator Lamb on the uh, HIV. <laughs> Again. Huh? Okay. I mean, uh, is, uh, I'll tell you what. Is Fox, we, we've done a lot of work. Yeah, go We're going to hold that till okay. later in the week or next week. Um, look, I was hoping it would be two hours. Obviously, it's been two and a half hours plus. Look, I want to, I want to thank all of you. Um, I, I think we're getting into having deeper conversations and more nuanced conversations, and I appreciate it. You know, I, I think it means... We're taking this stuff seriously, not that we haven't in the past. Uh, obviously, there are politics around this this horseshoe. We understand that. But I think on a lot of things that affect the people of the state, we're looking a little deeper. Uh, and it's true. You know, the House does some homework on some bills more than we do, and then we spend some more time on other bills than they do. And that's how it is in the legislature. So... Uh, Again, I want to thank you for that. I have Senator Patterson and then Senator Lamb, and then we'll conclude. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just didn't quite understand what you said about 448. You got to go to the speaker, you said? No. Um, you know, Senator Ellis introduced a bill that we've been sitting on about um, Maryland Emancipation Day as a holiday, and it's not to say we can't have two holidays. Mm -hmm. um, the House has moved this Juneteenth bill. Uh, there's been talk of adding official holidays and not adding official holidays, and when they become state holidays, they're cost items uh, because it's paid holidays. So I, I just wanted to get a better sense of things from the Senate and the House leadership as well as Senator Ellis, um, and it's a House bill, so I think if we have to wait a day or two, I just think it makes more sense. <clears throat> okay, uh, Senator Lamb. Sure. So uh, I think, Mr. Chairman, you wanted me to remind you about the maintenance injectable bill. I'm happy to, to just give a little bit of background Excuse on me. that. Yeah. So um, you'll probably recall the maintenance injectable bill, the Senator Young's bill um, that's passed through here. Um, and the House version just came to us last week and was on second reader today, moved to third reader. I'm getting some indications from the um, House side in HGO that they um, didn't feel that they had full awareness of the STI amendment because while we had that included as part of our hearing, um, that wasn't brought up in their hearing. And so um, one consideration that we're having is to offer an amendment to have the Department of Health um, essentially study that part of the STI amendment. Um, to include the provision in there, but to study it and come back with recommendations as to whether that provision should be sunsetted or not. Sorry, sexual transmitted infections, the STIs. Um, and so the, the, the amendment that's under consideration now is, is that, to kind of study whether a sunset would be appropriate, but keep the provision in. I wanted to at least bring it to the awareness of the committee, um, because it's on third reader, and one consideration we're having is whether to offer it on third reader tomorrow. Does that summarize uh, where we're at? But I'm open to, to thoughts on that. We don't know if the bill's going to move. There could be a conversation, and it could be special ordered, or 
the good senator has tried to come up with what he thinks is a compromise, and we can add it on the bill that we passed and send it back and see if they like it any better. So that's where we are. And, and Senator Lamb wanted to know whether he could offer the amendment on third reader to see if it jump-started the conversation. Right. And if anybody had an objection to it. Okay, then you're on your own. It's, a, it's a, an individual. It's your amendment, but I hear no major objections. Okay. Or no, any objections. Let, let me clarify one thing because I keep forgetting this. It's, you know, so many bills go through here. Uh, the bill I referred to, Senator Ellis, we did have on the list and we killed. But that doesn't mean that may or may not be a better approach. And whether it's amended into the House bill or whether we wait until next year, I just, I don't know what the solution is to official holidays. You know, and I don't want to be precipitous and we said no to that one. This bill comes in front of me and say yes. I don't know what the right answer is. So I just want to talk to, even though the bill is not in front of us right now, Senator Ellis, it may be in the long term the right thing to do. So I, I wanted to talk to Senator Ellis, the Senate president, and, and have them speak to uh, the speaker as well. So I just don't want to act precipitously. Okay. Um, thank you all. I, we will have a voting session probably Friday. We have the 14 local house bills on alcohol. That shouldn't take but 45 minutes. And hopefully we'll have a more modest list of an hour or two so we can get out of here at a reasonable time on Friday. Um, Senator Hester. Can you just clarify, do you know if it will be Friday morning or Friday afternoon? I have a strong preference for the morning. If an <laughs> other, other other meetings. I, I just don't know if they're. Hold, hold one second. Hold one second. It's Easter weekend. Well, let me ask this. Can we do the alcohol bills in the morning? Is there any reason we can't? What, Thursday afternoons? Yeah. I'll, I'll stay till midnight yeah, Thursday. Do the alcohol bills Thursday afternoon. We already have a full day of bill hearings. Sorry. We already have a full day of bill hearings Thursday afternoon, so we can't schedule the alcohol bills for Thursday afternoon. Get a pizza. Um, I'll buy the pizza. But <laughs> it's Passover. Oh. <laughs> Do them in the morning. I, I guess we could. If the, I don't know what the house's schedule is, I mean, we do. Those hearings are sponsor only for the alcohol bills, but I don't know. Okay. I just don't know. How about how about this? It's a, somewhat of a compromise. We do a voting session before the floor at either 10, 10 or ten thirty, and we have a, a hard stop at the back end. Um, I don't think we're going to have a lot because once presentment's over, it's just the regular flow. Um, and then we'll do the alcohol bills after session on Friday. I I, well, I'm open to other suggestions, folks. I, you know, I don't have any magical answers here. Sorry. Sure about the meeting, your your meeting schedule and stuff. But is it possible to start a little earlier Friday and try to knock out as much as we can in the morning? Either ten thirty or ten. I just didn't know if we would get through the voting and the alcohol bill hearings. Start. So we're on the floor at noon Friday. Correct. We could start at nine. So it, what I was asking is, could we start earlier, like at nine Friday, or is, is that okay. too much of a conflict? Well, we also have to get shots, uh, or not shots, tests. Why do I keep confusing it? Um, okay, then we'll decide tomorrow. Look, keep your calendars open early and late. Well, not late. No matter what, we're not going to be here late on Friday. But keep Friday morning open, and we're going to try to get out of here 
you know, by 2 or 3 or 3.30 on, on Friday at the latest. If we can move it earlier, we will. So just keep Friday and we'll decide tomorrow. I don't know. I'm not sure what the voting list is yet. So I can help you. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. You want to vote on balloons again? <laughs>